Within the first 20 minutes of this movie, Sean Connery utters the line, I'm waiting to be impressed. Oh, me too. Me too. I'm John Renton with the Retro View of the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen from 2003. Coming up on the 20-year anniversary of this thing being offered to everybody. It should have been offered on a sacrificial altar and it should have had its head chopped off and we should have never had to see this movie. My God. My God were to start with this pile of goddamn abominable shit. This was an abomination against filmmaking. This movie has aged like goddamn milk. The CGI looked like shit in 2003, and it looks even worse now. There is so much wrong with this movie. I mean, it takes a bunch of, you know, sci-fi and <clears throat> fantasy characters, human centipedes them together, and puts them in an alter alternative uh, Victorian age, 1899, and... <laughs> Even taken as entertainment, this movie is a slop fest. This, Van Helsing, and a few other movies that came out in the early to mid-2000s, it convinced me that Hollywood is goddamn out of ideas. This was directed by Stephen Norrington, who ended up doing Blade a few years before this. The man that did Blade did this, and he was so turned off from the process and clashing with Sean Connery and... Just the general studio interference and overwrite and whatever that he said, I'm done. I'm done doing filmmaking. I'm done. He has apparently had nothing to do with directing the film since. I think he has a couple other credits after this, but they were like in a more of an advisory or smaller role. He said, okay, you want to do this? I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And apparently the clashes with Sean Connery were really, really goddamn bad. Even worse, according to people that were on the set. This was written by James Robinson, who did a movie and series called Stargirl. Ho, ho, ho. I couldn't even come up with the references because James Robinson didn't fucking know how to write this shit best. I hated this movie. I hated this. I hated everything about this goddamn movie. And... It should have at least been entertainment, and it wasn't, because nothing was allowed to breathe, and there's nothing wrong with doing frenetic action, but when you just say, hey, here are these characters, okay, why should we care about these characters? Oh, this one's obviously the villain. Oh, this, th we have the girl here. We have an Invisible Man, not the Invisible Man, because Fox didn't actually have the rights to the Invisible Man at this point, so they had to call him an Invisible Man. No, really. <laughs> So it's based on the comic book by Alan Moore and Kevin O'Neill. Apparently, Alan Moore was not very happy with uh, the twist that they put on his work, and I don't necessarily blame him, because this movie was a complete abomination. It was terrible. Sean Connery plays Alan Quartermain. And Sean Connery, boy, you want to talk about somebody that has a sordid past, one of, one of, if not the best James Bond of all time, and was in The Rock, Hell of a goddamn actor. Can't take that away from him. Of course, he abused, you know, at least a few women, which isn't necessarily shocking. I mean, it's not really shocking somebody from his era would be that way towards women. But read up on how Sean Connery treated women. <clears throat> so, yeah, he deserved to be put in the goddamn dirt for that. You don't do that to people. As great of an actor as he was, that needs to be fucking remembered. And he retired from acting after this. Well, Sans a couple, like, voiceover, you know, pieces that he did, but he ended up dying, hopefully horribly, in 2020, I, I just want to say. And that sucks, because I love Sean Connery's movies, but you just can't ignore that shit. Um, the guy to play Captain Nemo, I'm not even going to attempt to pronounce his name. I'm not going to take a look at, take a look at the name. I, I don't want to discredit. He, he, he looked, he looked like Nemo, I'll say that much. <laughs> and we had Peter Wilson, who played, uh... Mina Harker, who was, you know, who was very, very smart and a scientist, but also a vampire. Peter Wilson wasn't supposed to be in this role. It was supposed to be Monica Bellucci. Monica Bellucci is a bloodsucker that likes to violate men and, you know, pin them down and suck them dry. Sign me the fuck up. But yeah, I would, have, I would have absolutely lost it in the theater if it was Monica Bellucci, who's 10 years older than Peter Wilson and doesn't even, didn't even look 30 when she did Brotherhood of the Wolf that came out a little bit before this. And Peter Wilson... She looked great. I'm not knocking her. I just love Monica Bellucci more. And <laughs> Stuart Townsend was in this. Stuart Townsend made so many bad decisions as far as mainstream movies that he did that pretty much after this, I mean, he's been in stuff, but has he been in anything high profile in a leading role? I can't think of anything. Queen of the Damned and this back-to-back, -back, 
good goddamn Christ, he wasn't an amazing actor, but he could have certainly been a better leading man than this, or at least part of a good ensemble cast with a, be a beefier role, but nope, he just apparently had a really, really bad agent. <laughs> Shane West was in this. As the modern-day warrior, mean, mean stride to Dame's Tom Sawyer, I screwed the song up. do 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 so yeah, Shane West is in this. Jason Fleming, who apparently talked about the various, you know, incidents going on with everybody. And, you know, especially with Sean Connery and uh, Stephen Norrington, who I'm not saying was totally innocent. He might have been, he might have been in over his head, might have taken it out on people. But no other actors really on the set spoke out against Norrington. <clears throat> it seems like a lot of the blame goes on Connery. Connery got... 17 to 18 million, depending on uh, the report you believe. And he, that, that was pretty beepy. That was $78 million budget, and he got a good sizable chunk of it. <laughs> the, that, and it only made like $66.5 million at, in the U.S. and Canada box office, and a hundred like almost $180 million worldwide, and that's in 2003 money. I didn't bother to do the inflation calculator, but... Even so, it wouldn't have justified doing a sequel, and they teased doing a sequel. They really thought this was going to be a franchise. Thank God it wasn't, because this movie is fucking awful. So, 1899, <clears throat> and the age of incompetence, as I called it, because this movie is just one incompetent series of events on top of another. Location, location, location. <clears throat> All these, you know, modern weapons were here, and yes, it's alternative Victorian age and whatever and that kind of stuff, but there's no explanation for why these inventions are there, or why this technology is there. Stuff's just happening, and we just have to accept it, which, if you have a movie that has a breezy pace to it and fun, especially the fun factor, fun factor must be amplified, you don't make it aggressively boring with really, really stale characters and make your actors seem like idiots... If you have the fun factor, you can make a bonkers premise like this work. <laughs> but in the hands of, well, incompetent jackasses and a studio that didn't want this movie to actually be any good or any fun, it ends up being a slog fest. So, <sighs> apparently, I, I, this weird tank thing just rolls through and goes into the Bank of England, just keeps rolling through, and apparently Scotland Yard was not aware that there was a tank. There's somehow sitting around here like, wait, how did it burst out of this building? How do we not know this? I mean, I don't know that we're in, you know, that we're in this Victorian age and everything, and all this stuff is so surprising to us, but nobody else seems surprised by it, just us idiots. <clears throat> um, the Germans get blamed, because of course the Germans get blamed, because the Germans always get blamed for stuff like this, because tomorrow belongs to them. And... <sighs> There's this guy called the Phantom, F, F-A-N-T-O-M. Yes, Phantom. Mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then everybody just, uh, and then everybody just, you know, lays down. One guy gets crushed by a tank. Stuff gets stolen from the bank. And then we suddenly go to Kenya, and Sean Connery as Alan Quartermain is there. <laughs> he turned down a role, apparently... He was rumored to possibly be uh, offered the role of Morpheus and the Matrix. God, that would have been just terrible. You imagine Sean Connery at that age trying to fight Lawrence Fishburne made that role work. He also turned down the role of Gandalf in Lord of the Rings. God, could you imagine him instead of Ian McKellen? And Sean Connery, again, hell of an actor. Woman beater, but hell of an actor. Quarterman wants no more adventures. That's it. I don't want any more of this. Well, then some guys with armored planes show up and shoot up this goddamn place and set some explosions. And these parts are so unbelievable because Sean Connery was approaching 70 at this point. And I know that, yes, with Liam Neeson and Taken since then and a lot of other movies, yes, you have to suspend, you know, like, belief. You just have to basically take the belief and throw it out the goddamn window. But this was egregious even for you know, action movies. This this was just bad. <laughs> and he shot a guy, you know, because he's a really, really good shot, but he had to put on glasses. God, I hate getting old. And, and a guy named M shows up. You know, M, like James Bond. Ha, 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 ha. And then, the Phantom is the villain, with an F, for maximum stupidity. So... 
There's a guy named Skinner who's an Invisible Man, not the Invisible Man. And you have Peter Wilson. Stuart Townsend is Dorian Gray, the man that stays young as long as he doesn't look at his portrait. It always grows old. And then you have Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Then you have various other people and everything. And all these characters don't mean anything. Especially in this vacuum. The movie should have been put in a vacuum. The vacuum of space. Along with anybody that thought that this was a good idea at Fox. So, uh, Quartermain saw a witch doctor. He told him what to do. He said, ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah. Okay, I'm not going to do that. He saved him and said, as long as you're on African soil, Africa won't let you die. But now he's in, now he's in England again. And <clears throat> Tom Sawyer just decides to, d decides to pop up at one point because the Phantom's guards suddenly show up while M is there. Oh no, it's not M. It's they're greeting Dorian Gray. Dorian Gray's here, and suddenly all these people are up in this big library, and then Tom Sawyer say, Ha, huh, I'm here. Boom, 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 and he just shoots everybody. And then he introduces himself, and I'm not even kidding, Special Agent Sawyer of the American Secret Service. SAS of ass. If that isn't you know, a metaphor for how this movie is, I don't know what is. It's not sassy, but it is total ass. Uh, Peter Wilson mentions, uh, uh, you know, her husband knowing Van Helsing and getting bit by Dracula, <laughs> which is why she's vampiric and she sucks people off. Could have probably worded that better, but let's just move on. More references and everything. Suddenly the giant Nautilus, it, it looks so impressive. If you just look and you're like, wow, I'm looking at a green screen, but this looks so impressive. You're going to fix it in post, right? Yes, we will. Look at how impressive this is. And the Nautilus uh, somehow can fit, apparently, in any canal. Literally any canal. Despite the fact it's about 40 stories tall in some shots. <laughs> oh, God damn it. Why is, why, why is this, why? By the way, the Nautilus showing up and, you know, made, you know makes everybody laugh just because of how stupid it looks. And Captain Nemo says, <coughs> suddenly... Here is my here is my mate. Call me Ishmael. I'm not kidding. That's what they said. Also, there's a giant car. I call it an automobile. In 1899, will these will never succeed? God, I wish this movie hadn't made a goddamn dime at the box office. I'm get when I worked at the theater at the time and watched this, and I felt ripped off in my free time. <sighs> so. Obviously, Dr. Jekyll has his potion, and various people have their own things going on. You know, they have their own powers. Well, suddenly there's this weird photography, you know, powder that's found, but and Peter Wilson discovers it, and strange things are going on. They suspect Skinner, because he's an invisible man, is doing this. No, it's actually Dorian Gray. Shocking. The guy that is purely evil is actually evil. Ow. That hurt considerably. But yeah, it's Dorian Gray. Stuart Townsend playing another evil guy. I guess that's all he was allowed to play because I guess he just looked evil. I'm sure he's a nice guy, but he just, I guess, always looked evil. They're like, you're the bad guy. Okay, can I play the hero sometime? No, you may not. <sighs> Alan lost his son in England, and I left my heart in San Francisco. Heart in San Francisco, the Kali Ma 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 Treat. Yeah, I should retro-view the Indiana Jones movies at some point. <laughs> and I have a question. How in the world did the Nautilus fit in the Canals of Venice? How? The Canals of Venice aren't... I don't think they're that deep. I don't think that's how that works. I'm not saying, by the way, that... You know, I'm not saying that something couldn't fit down there, because with Venice, they travel by boat. The banana boat, the la, 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 or whatever the hell they say. God, Italian people watching this are going to be so pissed off. I'm sorry. But Hyde has a crisis of faith because he doesn't want to give in. Every time he gives in, Hyde takes over more, but Jekyll says no. And then... <laughs> the Phantom wants to sink Venice. Why does the Phantom want to sink Venice? Why not? There are explosions set all over the goddamn place. That 
thing would have not fit in Venice, by the way, the Nautilus, considering, again, it's 40 feet tall. <laughs> the bombs go off anyway before they can find it. All bunch of barrels and everything because Donkey Kong said, I'm not throwing these barrels. I'm going to sink this stuff. <laughs> okay, I'm done. And then he threw it at Nixon's head and then crawled up the ladder. So, that goddamn early 2000s CGI, Jesus, I mean, I know technology advances and they did the best they could, but good God, what, why, how, how many, not even henchmen, how much help did Nemo have on this vessel? He had like an endless supply of people. It was literally about 6,000 people he had. It was amazing. Actually, it was more like 500, but still. We need more explosions and gunplay. Hey, here's an idea. We need to get ahead of these explosions that are sinking these buildings and costing innocent lives while this carnival's going on and everybody's just staying around like, you know, we probably should move, but where are we going to move? Oh, I don't know. Let's just keep watching this. Yes. Mm, yes mm, mm. And then Super Mario comes in and jumps on a Goomba and then everybody looks at him wondering what the hell he's doing there in 1899. So basically a few people get in the car, including Quartermain, <clears throat> Miss Harker and uh, Tom Sawyer, mean, mean pride, the modern day warrior, the modern day shooter. <laughs> Carrie Von Erich was a modern day shooter in February of 1993. This is going well. <clears throat> I just, the, what makes me laugh even more is the fact that they're driving this car, <clears throat> this large car down the side streets, the sidewalks, the walking paths of Venice, and somehow not immediately going off the goddamn thing because plot convenience. They get ahead of the explosions while Peter Wilson says, I'm going to turn into a bunch of bats and attack a whole bunch of people. Quartermain jumps out of a moving car going at least 50 miles an hour and it just, boop, lands on his feet and decides to go after the Phantom. Then Shane West somehow crashes the car, <coughs> shoots off the flare, and then they launch a rocket that goes all the way up into the into space and then comes back down and stops the explosions. Like getting ahead and stopping the chain reaction. Physics. And then Quartermain ends up com uh, cutting into um, cutting through a cemetery or garden and finds out who the Phantom is. The Phantom is M. What? It's the guy that recruited them, the guy that's obviously evil along with Dorian. And also Dorian took out Ishmael because he didn't want any call me Ishmael dummy jokes me made. And he escapes in an escape pod. <clears throat> what else would you be using an escape pod for? Also, <clears throat> there's a recording disc, a record that has video with it. I wonder if they were able to see this video, despite the fact that video recording, even audio recording, I don't really think it been, well, audio recording might have been made, but the whole point is, how are they doing this? Oh, well. Fortunately, I don't care. And then there's a weird inaudible sound that is going to trigger all these explosions and blow up the Nautilus and damage it and everything. But somehow they manage to survive because um, Hyde comes back and says, I'm going to I'm going to take the potion and pull on this thing and relieve the water out of the Nautilus. And then we're going to make the repairs within literally three minutes, literally three minutes. That, that's how long it takes for them to make it. Good, I guess they had every goddamn supply of mineral known to man on this thing. Why this movie pissed me off in retrospect, I don't know. It turns out that Dorian Gray took pieces of them because he's working for M, and M wants to create a clone army and take over the Earth, and Darth Vader's gonna... Wait, that's another type of clone army. That movie came out the year before this and had Yoda and Christopher Lee fighting each other. It's weird that uh, Yoda would be fighting somebody older than him. And... How did they how did they get the Nautilus ready? I have so many I have so many questions. I have so many goddamn questions. The green screen effects were absolute goddamn ass. 100% ass. They end up um, in Mongolia and they're trying to, you know, take down City Walk and take down uh, their city wall. That's really really terrible. I can't believe that South Park reference is stuck in my head. There was a snow kitty at one point, a snow tiger, the most fleshed out character in the movie by the way, and I think it was CGI. And they're waiting in a cave. Turns out Skinner had snuck into the factory. <coughs> Says, by the way, there are a whole bunch of Iron Man. Dur, 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 dur. And they captured all these scientists. They're holding the family's hostage. Work morning, noon, and night. Noon and night. And your and your families will be safe. Otherwise, they'll be killed. 
hey, we need to get in there and set some explosions. Skinner, you're uh, you're invisible. Go set some explosions. Oh, wait, but they're creating clone versions of us, so they're going to create clone versions of invisible people, invisible people. Oh. Of Hyde, of Peter Wilson's Harker. And that's pretty much it. Because, <laughs> I mean, you could make a clone of Nemo. I don't know why you would want to. And Tom Sawyer. Unless you want to clone another modern-day warrior. And Quartermain. He's an old man. Why are you going to do that? So... <laughs> Well, they rescue the prisoners easily. Like, most of the prisoners are freed within five seconds of them getting into this particular place. And then stuff just happens. People get in fights. There's this there's this fight between Harker and Dorian Gray, because Dorian Gray decides, I don't want to be around M, and M's getting a haircut at one point, and then he says, this henchman says, here's your stuff, by the way, we're getting assaulted by people. What? How? Who would have thought that they would have figured this out? Oh, his name's James Moriarty. Ah, ha, ha. God, let's get more references. Shoehorn more shit in this movie, why don't you? And then we get just more fights. We get Hyde, and we get a super Hyde. <clears throat> the guy, Reed, I think. No, Reed was the invisible guy. One of the guys uh, drinks the entire goddamn vial like he's, you know, drinking the entire thing from Super Mario 2, a.k.a. Doki Doki Panic, drinks the entire goddamn thing, but there's no door that leads to a dark world. He just turns into a super Hyde that beats the shit out of Hyde, but, and even when Nemo does his little knifey trick at that, okay, that's not going to work, but he's burning through the formula at an accelerated rate, and then Tom Sawyer gets besieged by Reed, and... Peter Wilson eventually gets stabbed, but then Dorian Gray takes a knife out. She pins him against the wall and shows him the portrait, and he dies. He turns old, and then he goes into the portrait. Burn the portrait, why don't you? And then, yeah, the super hide was just absolutely terrible. But he gets knocked down and pressed down in a cave-in and killed. While everybody escapes while the bombs blow up. And Skinner was set on fire, but somehow is okay. Quarterman gets stabbed in the back, but he tells Tom Sawyer, yeah, by the way, go shoot. Um, go, go shoot this guy. Go shoot Moriarty. Moriarty, who has a wingsuit and somehow manages to fly down. It was at this point, I remember vividly in the theater yelling, oh, come on. Like, because that was the one unbelievable part. And then Quarterman says, just... Hold steady, Sawyer, and shoot him. And he shoots him. All the stuff falls into the goddamn sea, so we're going to get a series of super penguins at some point. Super penguins would have been a whole lot better than what we could have gotten in the sequel. It couldn't have been any worse than this. Maybe. Possibly. And also, Quartermain dies, because he's not in Africa. But then they take him back to Africa, and his grave is, um, you know... <clears throat> You know, surrounded by a witch doctor that told him what to do. He says, I'm going to raise you for the possible sequel. Okay, I can't even do that. Ooh, ee, ooh, ah, ah. And then it just fades away. It just fades to black with Quartermain possibly coming back. Who knows? This movie was shit. I don't even need to mix words. It was shit. It was terrible. The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen is neither a league, neither extraordinary, and John Connery certainly wasn't a gentleman. Really, at any point in his life. I mean, just think about it. Read up on it. Yeah. Anyway, let me know your thoughts in the comments. Like, share, subscribe, Twitter handle in the description. I'm John Rathlin. I'll see you soon.